you want to get your notes out, we're continuing part two of my mind on my money and my money on my mind. My mind on my money and my money on my mind. Say it with me on three. One, two, three. My mind on my money and my money on my mind. So if you want to find a, a note card there on the seat back in front of you, grab that. If you'd rather take out your phone and follow along digitally, you can go to lifepointnow.com info where you'll find all of our notes for today's message. But last week we started this series, and I don't have time to, to do much of a recap, but we acknowledged the simple fact that for most people, for most of us, money consumes way too much of our brain space. We got our mind on our money and our money on our mind way too much. And so we're taking three weeks and we're looking at biblical principles for handling money. So three principles over the course of three weeks. I gave you principle one last week and it's simply this, God is the owner, I am the what? I am the manager. Until we understand this principle, nothing else in this series is gonna make sense. God owns it all, I manage some, if I'm faithful with what I manage, God will entrust me with more. If I mismanage what God has given me, why would he ever entrust me with more? Bottom line. So now you don't have to go watch the message. But if you'd like to hear more about it, go to our YouTube channel. You can check out more on that. Let me give you principle two, and we'll dive into it today. Principle two is this. When it comes to biblical principles for our finances, number two is this. A little planning goes a long way. A little planning, write this down goes a long way. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 21, verse 5, that the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Notice the plans of the diligent lead to profit, but when we're hasty in life, they lead to poverty. Now, one of the reasons I believe that our minds are on our money and our money's on our minds is because we find ourselves like we're just not confident about our money. We aren't sure where it's at. It's like, I thought I had some. I thought there was some in my wallet. Let me check my Venmo real quick. I don't know if I have any. We're not sure where it's at. We're not sure when it's gonna be gone. And we really don't even know where it went. So we find ourselves thinking about this quite a bit. And so here's what I want you to know. Jot this down. To get our mind off our money, we need to get our money on a plan. To get our mind off our money, we need to get our money on a plan. And so to help me teach this principle today, I've asked my financial planner, my financial manager to join me on stage. So would you give a big life point welcome to my wife, Michelle. Come on. Thank Hi. you for joining me, babe. Sure. If we can share some embarrassing things about our life. And yeah. Help some people maybe not make those choices themselves. Yeah, you can clean up everything that, I've, uh, that, that I say wrong. Um, so for those of you that have not had the chance to meet my wife, this is my wife, Michelle. And so this summer we celebrated 25 years of marriage. Let's go. Yeah, that's a long time. Boom. <laughs> 25 years of awesomeness. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Will you give That's me funny. like 17, 18 years of awesome? 18 years has been There we go. Good. There we go. Yeah. Any married people back us up on that? Like, it, it's not all good, okay? You said better or worse, and you, you didn't mean it, but you had to get yeah. through the worse to get through the better. There's a lot of worse. There was a lot of worse. <laughs> yes. Is there anything else you'd like to say about that? Uh, <laughs> it's so much better now. I think the biggest issue was what we're talking about, our money. Hey, so here's the thing. This is not meant to be a marriage message, but if, um, if your marriage is not in a good place, I would take good notes today because here's the thing for us. For, for us, money has not always been an easy topic to talk about. It's, um, as a matter of fact, we, we hated it so much that we, I don't think we, in the early days, we never really talked. I don't remember having any conversations about money. So when we got married, would you say we, what, what kind of a plan did we have? <laughs> we didn't have a plan. Okay, so there's... <laughs> That's why we... But, all right, but, but, I, but for good reason, though, let me explain. Up until this point, we didn't really need one. Like, I mean, when you're dating, who needs a plan when you're dating? Dating was so easy, wasn't it? Like, one of the misconceptions in dating is that, that things just work. Like, we never lacked things to talk about. Mm -hmm. Communication came easy. We had the same interests. We, uh, you know... I remember coming up with creative date ideas. Like, yeah, I used to write me poems. And I was all, I was songs. a mad lyricist with my poetry. <laughs> so it was good. Sweet. 
we would buy thoughtful gifts for each other. I mean, you, you'd, th- you'd find yourself thinking things like, how, how did I find the one person that's so much like me? Mm-hmm. Which is, uh, you know, amazing. And we would rarely disagree on things. The topic of money never really comes up when you're dating. We had like little to no bills, if any, back then. And, and of course, you know, you're in, we were in college, so like it felt like you were busy, but let's be real. You had 15 hours of classes. They may realize when you graduated, you traded 15 hours of classes for 50 hours of work. You're like, no wonder some people never graduate. They just stay in it. And so dating just works, but then you get married and you find out that marriage takes work and it's a lot of it. Yeah. Tons of it. How about this? Take, let's not assume people know our story. I know we've shared it a couple times. Take people back to when I swept you off of your feet. Those early days. 28 years And we'll walk ago. you through. Yeah, it was 28 Forever. years ago. We'll walk you through a little bit of our story, and then we'll get into kind of what we want to unpack and what we've learned. Yeah. We met in 1995. Yep. Do you remember the, our first date was when? Oh, gosh. September 25th, 1995. Okay, good job. Yep. <laughs> Seen if you knew that. <laughs> um, we met at college, so at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, we dated for about three years, and then we got married June 6, 1998. Mm-hmm. D-Day. Um, and we both worked at a summer camp. That was our first job. We were making mad money when we, when we, I think it was 200 bucks a week we were each yeah, bringing in. I think our apartment was like 200 or 400 bucks a month. It was great. We were eating all of our meals at camp, so. Living was, the dream. Yeah. So here we were, newlyweds, uh, thought we were going to spend our, our life working at this camp, or at least the next season, found out that the job that we were promised was no longer there. Um, money had been embezzled, and so we had no job. So we were married for a couple months, but, you know, God worked it out, and the opportunity opened for our first, my first full-time youth ministry job in Albemarle, North Carolina. Go ahead, mm-hmm. shout out Kelly Pickler. <laughs> yep, the ALB. And you remember getting like the first, I feel like, I don't know how many of you guys remember this. You remember getting your first full-time paycheck? Like up until this point, it was all like minimum wage type of things. And then you got your first full-time and you were like, I can't believe somebody paid me this much money. (laughs) What are we going to do with all of this? We were making, I remember this, we were just shy of $20,000 a year was my very first full-time. Now my wife reminded me this was like 25 years ago, but I remember us thinking like, I'm working for, you know, this church, making, like, bank mm-hmm. stacks. <laughs> you, you got a job working for the sheriff's department, yeah. and um, we had, you know, we, we had this rental house that I think was, what, about 450 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. And the only debt we had was my school loans. Yep. That was it. That's what you brought to the equation. And we were like, what do we need? We need more debt, right? Well, I don't even know that we were, we definitely didn't, nobody says that's what they need. But do you remember when you're like making money and you're, you're thinking like, I can finally buy those things that I've always wanted. And so the thing that I had wanted, now mind you, I'm living in Albemarle, and if you're a dude in Albemarle, you gotta have a big truck. You know, if you ain't got a truck, you ain't nothing. So I remember mm-hmm. like, it, you know, we, we had to get a truck. I remember finding this, yeah. um, this Chevy Z71, it was $24,000. We had so much to tow and carry in that truck. Well, I didn't necessarily need it for like work-related things. I needed it just cause, you guys know what I'm talking about. So we buy this truck, which turns out to be dumb decision number one that we made. And I'm not, don't worry, we're not gonna give you all the dumb decisions because we would be here for days. Dumb decision number one, we bought this truck, and here's why the reason it was a dumb decision. We, we didn't, we had no plan going in. We hadn't counted the cost at all. So we get this truck, it was about three months later that like, I mean, do you, have you ever put gas in a truck like that? <laughs> Holy cow. The gas was outrageous, the car payment was, you know, because we thought it was gonna be this, but when you left, it turned out to be this. The insurance, it, we kept that truck for three months. We drove it to another dealership and we traded it in on a Honda Civic. So clearly, <laughs> my man card was cashed in. But here's what, what happened is, so we traded, we downgraded and we, we inherited or we earned what's called negative equity. You guys know what that means? That means you owe more on the asset than the asset is worth. So you can never sell the thing and actually get out of debt. Yeah. And that started creating issues in our marriage. We started feeling a tension that was new to our relationship, arguments about money. I remember like, why can't I buy this? And she's like, well, because you, you already spent that money. And I'm like, but, but I earned it. I mean, it, to me, it was a lot of money coming in. 
And it wasn't, I mean, that truck was a huge decision, but then the rest of them that kind of got us into a bad, bad habits. I mean, it just happened over time slowly. It wasn't like. It was like death by a thousand cuts. It wasn't yeah. like one massive. It was just a bunch of little things. And like, I, I just remember, um, because for, for me, my first, my first job was when I was 15. I told you Bed Bath & Beyond. And so when I started working, I didn't work because I had to. I worked because there was just things I wanted to buy. And so when I got a paycheck, guess what I did with it? Whatever I wanted. <laughs> well, here I am getting my paychecks, and I can no longer do what I want. And that was, a, it was like, does not compute. <laughs> this doesn't make yeah. sense to me. And so we got into this where we started hoping, like, um, we hoped that our check would get deposited in the bank. I know you guys have never been in this place, but we hoped our check hit the bank before our bills had to be paid. Does anybody know, play this game? Yeah. Now, the good news is the, the bank, we were with Wachovia, which I don't think they're around anymore, no. RIP. They loved us so much that they would actually front us the money if we didn't have money in the account. Yeah, overdraft. They'd send us postcards every month. Yeah. They loved us. <laughs> It was like $100 this month, a couple hundred dollars the next, and like over time, but we got introduced to credit lines yes. at that point. Yeah, so, but then, here's what's crazy, is in the midst of all of that, we managed to qualify to buy a house, <laughs> so we did. Yeah. And then we had our first kid, which they're expensive if you've ever had one of those. <laughs> um, I read recently, to keep your child, uh, you know, from birth to 18 is actually now over $300,000. Yeah, some of you were like, okay, we were thinking four or five, two is good. <laughs> I'm just saying they're expensive. So we had a kid, and because, you know, you have one kid, we might as well go ahead and have another kid. So then we had another kid, and, you know, when you start having kids, you know what you got to get, right? Minivan. Mm -hmm. We have to have a minivan. Gotta, you know, my wife can't be putting the kids in the back of this car. And, and, and so this whole time, we never knew how to talk about money. Our marriage was struggling, because apparently it's hard to be intimate with somebody that you resent. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> well, my background was accounting. I started working when I was 10. I babysat. I did people's ironing. I cleaned houses. So, and I kept track of my money. I thought about this last week. I actually had a journal where I wrote down what I made, my expenses. I was doing a checkbook register before I had a checkbook. Um, and so getting into high school, I took accounting classes, I took accounting in college, and so part of this was understanding that, well, feeling like it was my job to set this budget up and get I our finances in order. I felt that way too. I felt that I was, know you did. I was like, we're going to be so good because she's good with all this stuff. But then when you start having kids, you just forget about it, and it's something we never talked about. There's a lot of shame in it for me because I'm like, I should know better. I know she should know how to do this. Yeah, you should have known better I, is what I was thinking that's too. That's what I got from you, and that's why the resentment, you know. Well, but <laughs> <laughs> so it was. It was, it was, a, it was a, some dark days, some cold, mm -hmm. lonely days <laughs> in I our relationship. I was fine. I Everything was, was fine. I was, we still don't know how we got three kids no. out of this season of our life. I'm just being honest. I don't know. I want to believe our children were conceived out of passion, but it might have just been pity. I don't know. <laughs> we, we love you guys, though. You might watch this at yes. some point. Here's, here's, here was our issue, okay? Lots of issues. So, so but fast forward, we got three kids. We feel like we're buried under bad decisions after bad decisions. The trouble was we worked at a church. Where do, who do we talk to about this? You know, we, we, we got to pretend like everything's fine and pretend like everything is good, but it wasn't. And the Bible actually says this in Proverbs 13, 7. I definitely resonate with this. One man pretends to be rich, okay? One man pretends to have it all working for them, going, going you know, great. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Can I tell you, it's never been easier to pretend that you got it all together. Thank you, social media. You know, hashtag real life, hashtag blessed. It's so easy to pretend that, that we are in a good place when the reality is the stats say that a lot of us are not. And so that's the mess that we found ourselves in. So we wanna give you four thoughts 
about getting your mind off your money. If you wanna get to where it is not so consuming, let me give you four thoughts that, that we've had to walk through and in some cases still walk through. So number one is this, acknowledge the obvious. Write this down. You have to acknowledge the obvious. Like if your current financial plan is working, awesome, keep working it. But if it's not, admit it, acknowledge it. Anybody remember the movie Apollo 13? Anybody remember seeing this? Tom Hanks was in it. It was a real story, real story. Well, the, the back story on the, on the, is this. April 13th, 1970. 56 hours into this mission to the moon, oxygen tank number two explodes, causing damage to the control module. And command module pilot Jack Swigert, his voice comes over the radio, and here's what he says. Houston, we've had a problem here. Houston, we've had a problem here. Six words get transmitted over the airwaves. And in these six words, these six words lead to what ends up saving their lives. Because they took an honest assessment and said, we've got a problem here. And I wonder how many of us need to take a real honest assessment of our finances in radio in Houston. We've had a problem here. Instead of saying, it's fine, everything's fine, we're gonna be fine. I love the meme of the little dog. You know, the cartoon dog and the house is on fire. It's like, I'm, it's fine, everything's fine. How many of us are saying it's fine when it's not? We're pretending that it's fine when the reality is it's not. Because here's, here's what we've acknowledged last week, and let me just reiterate it. Everybody deals with this, okay? Every single one of us deal with the tension when it comes to finances. Financial stress, we're told, is normal. We're told that it's, you're, it, you're supposed to feel that way. You're supposed to feel like it's always going to be tight. Like, that's normal. That's what, that's what culture wants you to believe. I, I found this article on LendingTree.com, and it was ranking our nation, our states and our nation, based upon credit card debt. Praise God, we're not number one, okay? Number one is Connecticut. I don't know if anybody online is joining us from Connecticut, but y'all better cut up those credit cards, because they say the average, uh, the highest, the highest credit card average is Connecticut with $9,408 on a credit card, if you're in Connecticut. Okay, that's average, so some are higher, some are lower. North Carolina, we are 28th in the nation in credit card debt with $6,955 is the average credit card debt for adults in North Carolina. Now, what's crazy is, you know, think that most of those are 20, 24% APR. I mean, that's gonna, that's a load of money, and yet, we're told this is normal. We're told there's nothing wrong with this. Yahoo Finance reported that 49% of Americans, let's just call it half of Americans, depend on credit cards to cover essential living expenses. And yet we tell ourselves it's fine, everything's fine. But I know for us, everything wasn't fine. And we didn't know how to talk about it or even what to do about it, so we just accepted it. We accepted that this is going to be what life is like. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, 7, it says, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Would you say that's how we felt? That's how I felt, yes. Would you <laughs> care, to, care to expound on how you I, felt? I felt that, um, well, first of all, we didn't know how to talk about stuff, so I felt like you didn't care and I was carrying the weight of all of this debt um, myself. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely felt like a slave. So, and, and I think when I finally got clued into the, to the problem, which, to be mm -hmm. honest, I mean, we did not talk about it. So there were just things that, like, I, I, I went on shopping sprees, guys. Let's just, I'm just gonna own this here, okay? <laughs> like, I remember I bought, a, I bought a Taylor acoustic guitar. My guitarist, you know, those are great guitars. But here's the deal, it was like, it was like three months 0% financing, same as cash. I can pay this off in three months, right? Because I'm making so much money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trouble is, is I didn't. And so when that interest hits, it, it, hits, it hits hard. And then I got around a bunch of people that were into like hunting and guns. Well, I, I, you know, I gotta get one of those or two because um, you need a backup. And then, you know, I was with a bunch of pastors and they played golf and I can't borrow golf clubs. You can't use another person's mm -hmm. golf clubs. So. You know, these golf clubs, these my, you know, I was told these are really good. I'm saving money on these golf clubs is what I'm, you know, it's, it's like $300 off. So it's practically free. <laughs> and so now it wasn't like I was doing this all in a week. It was spread out. But I wouldn't even, like, I wouldn't even tell her about it. I would just, they just show up. She's like, when did, where, where, whose golf clubs are those? 
If you've ever been secretly hiding purchases from your spouse, warning, warning, Houston, we've had a problem here. That's where we were at. Now, I, I wanna say something about debt because the Bible does address debt, but I want you to tell you, it, based upon my studies of scripture, it's not wise, but I also want you to know debt's not sinful, but it can be stressful. And so I'm not telling you that you should avoid it at all costs, but I am telling you that if you don't have a plan, you better avoid it because it will jump into the driver's seat of your life. And so, so question to, to you, babe. Looking back, we're talking about acknowledging the obvious. What was obviously not fine from that stage of our life? Well, I feel like I was carrying such a huge weight. I would try to talk to you about it. We would always get into arguments. Um, we had kids at that point, and so I just felt this huge weight all the time. I didn't feel like you cared. You didn't want to work on things. Um, I think we just acknowledged that we didn't know how to communicate, first off. Second, we didn't have a plan. We acknowledged that. Um, we were, there was no intimacy, like you said. I was full of resentment. There was never a point where I was like, I'm done with this. Like, I'm leaving. Like, I made the choice to love you. you it was I, a there choice. There was a lot of times I did not like you very much. Um, and I think I showed that very well. You I showed it like loud you. and clear. Um, but, I, yeah, I, I think at that point I had given up, and all I was praying was like, God, this is your man. You take care of him because, obviously, he's not listening to me. So well, what, what about you? Like, so here's what's crazy is, is she's over here praying like, God, you got to do something. And, and God's really good about getting the message. We're, we're just not always good at receiving it. And so I remember um, Pastor Daryl and myself, as we were getting, getting uh, LifePoint Church started, so we went to a conference that was down in Atlanta. It was a, called Catalyst, and Dave Ramsey was doing a session. And I just remember thinking, like, I'm going to skip out on that because, I mean, I never heard him speak, but he's a financial advisor, and I just, you know, most finance people I know are just kind of snooze fest, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> Praise God I didn't. I sat through this, and can I tell you, it was like a switch got flipped inside of me, and something, something changed where I, I, he talked a lot about having a picture of what life could be if you weren't a slave to debt, and I just remember feeling like the reason that we're, so, we're struggling so bad is we're sending so much money to debt every single month. And I started realizing, like, if we weren't sending all that money to debt every month, we could be saving. We could be, you know, there's things we could do. We, we weren't able to do vacations. There was just stuff that we couldn't do because, quite honestly, we'd already spent that money. I'd, always made, I'd already made bad decisions. And I remember before I ever left that conference, I called her and I said, when we get home, can we talk about money? I listen to Dave Ramsey, and, I, and something's got to change. And so I make this phone call, and what, do you, like, what happened in you when you heard me say, can we talk about this? Um, I felt like a weight was lifted off of me. And it was just a phone call. Like, nothing had changed yet. We were still in debt. We still didn't have a plan. But I think knowing that we were on the same page, we were finally unified about our finances, just took a huge weight off of me. It was big, and we, we are very different. Chances are, if you're married, you married somebody that's different than you. Those of you that are dating, I know they're like, oh, they're just like me. No, they're not. <laughs> they are not, okay? They're putting their best foot forward, and they're pretending to like everything you like, and yeah. <laughs> you don't get the worst until you get married, okay? <laughs> In a relationship, there's almost always, almost always a saver and a spender, a not so fun person and a fun person, okay? It's just, it happens. <laughs> My wife is the saver, and as you can imagine, I'm the fun one. <laughs> Which makes sometimes a, a, difficult, a difficult road to walk. But the Bible tells us in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, do two people walk together unless they've agreed to do so? It's hard to stay in unison with somebody if you're not headed in the same direction, moving at the same pace, and that's what we need in our relationship. And you discovered something kind of early that you felt like I, it's like if, if he would change, if he would change, but you learned early on, I wasn't the enemy, was I? No. I might have been the problem, weren't. but I wasn't the enemy. <laughs> no, Ephesians talked about how we have an enemy, and it's not flesh and blood, you know, it's not the people around us, it's... Satan trying to steal, kill, and destroy, which is what he's good at. Um, and so our lack of communication, that kind of gave Satan an inroad to make me feel like all of this is his fault. You're the enemy. And um, I think until 
up until this point, you know, we weren't walking together on this issue, but also I had realized you're not my enemy. Um, it's just God needed to do some work on you. Okay, so let's, <laughs> and he did. And he did. And he, he did. did. Jesus. <laughs> but real quick, so you felt like there was resentment towards me in our relationship, what changed almost instantly when we started, when we started working together? Um, I felt like there was hope. Yeah. And I will also add, I was trying to bait you into saying this, but our intimacy in, instantly oh. <laughs> improved when we got on the same page. So some yes. of you, you're like, I don't want to talk about this. Well, let me give you another reason to talk about it. Do it. We made love more, which was great. <laughs> So number one, okay, acknowledge the obvious. Number two, here's the second thing is get help. Get help. Get help, okay? So back to the, the Apollo 13 real quick. As soon as the astronauts of Apollo 13 acknowledged the obvious, they reached out to Command Central. Houston, we've had a problem here. What Command Central did is they recreated the cockpit. They took all of the equipment that the astronauts had at their disposal, and they said, all right, here's what they have to work with. How do we get them back home? And they, they asked for help, and when they asked for help, they received it. And here's the thing. Most people don't have a problem acknowledging that they've got a problem. Most of us are like, okay, I've got a problem. Where we struggle is asking for help. It's like, I need somebody to, to help me out. Most of us don't want to do that. We don't want to admit it. We don't know where to go. I mean, let's just, I'll shoot straight. Getting somebody to look at our finances, like an honest look at our finances, that ranks right up there with slipping into one of those backless gowns at the hospital. You just, you're like, I feel so vulnerable. I feel, it's like, could you, you should buy me a meal first, you know? This, this is, uh, it's drafty in here. Like, it's just, you feel exposed. But here's what we needed, okay? Because we would look at our budget and we'd try to work on it, but it's like, no, we can't cut that. We need that. We need... You get somebody that's not emotionally connected to your budget and your finances, what you need is outside insight. You need somebody that looks at it, another set of eyes that can start asking you really tough questions. And that's what we got. That's what we got. We put our pride aside because anytime we let pride lead, disaster will follow. Proverbs 16, 8, pride goes before destruction. If your pride is getting in the way, let me tell you, destruction is coming. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty, a puffed up, an arrogant spirit goes before a fall. So we knew how to get in a mess. We just didn't know how to get out of it. So we had the chance to sit down with a financial counselor. He took a painful look at our spending and started asking a lot of questions. And so one of the things that we've tried to do as a church is try to make this accessible to our church family so what we've done is we've put up a resource page on our website, lifepointnow.com slash money. Like, let me say it again just for those of you that, that didn't get it. Lifepointnow.com slash money. On there are resources. Matter of fact, our church pays about $12,000 a year for you to have access to Ramsey Plus. Okay, that's a lot of money for you to have access to Financial Peace University. There's an app called Every Dollar where you can work, you know, your budget out on your phone, on your computer. There's resources on, on you know, lending and saving. And, and so we'd encourage you, check that out. We pay for it. We want you to have it. You're also, at, at, at that link I gave you, you'll find a couple links to books. Last week I shared with you about this book called Managing God's Money. And it gets into all kinds of topics. It's not a fun read, but it's good to have if you're like, what does the Bible say about this topic? It's probably in this book. It's been really helpful to me. And so my wife and I, we got to sit down, and let me see if you remember this. There used to be a restaurant called Two Guys Grill. It was on College Road. There's still one out near our Porter's Neck campus. And so we sat down at Two Guys Grill with our financial counselor, and he went through every line of our expenses. Yeah, that was you, embarrassing. Yeah, you remember when he started crunching numbers? And he told us, he said, he said, if you guys are serious about getting out of your consumer debt, now everything but our house, mm -hmm. he said, if you're serious about this, do you remember what he said, how long it would take us? Uh, I think 24 months. Yeah. He said, you can be out of all of this in 24 months. What was your thought when you heard 24 months? I thought there's hope. Like, we're getting out of this hole. Okay, so this is definitely a testimony of how we think differently. <laughs> she hears there's hope. I'm like, that's like forever away. <laughs> 22, we're, it's like forever away. 
Because here's the thing about debt is you can get in it in an instant and spend years digging back out of it. And so for me, I'm like, oh, why bother? You know, and I, I knew we need to do this. But what he had us do is he had us start putting together a rough, a rough draft of a budget. Now, a budget's like, oh, he used the B word. It feels like a dirty word for some of us. It's a boring word, okay, for me. Budgets are boring. She was doing it for, like, fun when she was 12. <laughs> Change the name. Call it a spending plan if you want. A budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. That, that's all it is. And to this day... We still live with this budget. We, you know, we've, we've tweaked it, and this is your baby. Mm-hmm. I'm more I'm like, you just tell me what I have to spend. You have a certain category. Like I do. Three or four categories that you can touch, and that's I, it. Yeah, and the rest <laughs> of it, I just I leave it alone. But here's what we did. Just, just to give you a glimpse, okay, I went ahead and we did a screenshot of our budget. So we're going to throw that on the screen here, and we won't go line by line. I just want to show you a couple things. And I blurred out the dollar amounts because that's none of your business. <laughs> But I want you to show you, so this is in an app that we use, and this is very similar to the Every Dollar app, which is available to you for free with the Ramsey Plus. But so when we put together our budget, the first thing that matters to us is that we put God first. You're going to see our tithe at the top of our budget, and then Compassion, we have a child that we sponsor. And then there's, we just decided we want to create a little bit of margin. If God puts on our heart somebody going on a missions trip or somebody that we want to bless, that's up there. And so that's the top part of our budget. After that, you're going to begin to see our monthly bills. You're going to see our mortgage. You're going to see our utilities. You're going to see um, our, our cell phones. You're going to see any car loans. You're going to see insurance. Then at the bottom, probably tough to see on the screen, it becomes weekly expenses. Go to the next one. So when you get to this next one, here's some of the things I want you to see. And this is just where I, maybe I, I should let you unpack this, but I'm going to brag on my wife for a second. My wife is amazing at accruing for things. So you'll see there's a line item called fun goals. And so, you know, saving towards a vacation or like Top Golf is on there. She has been wanting to go to Top Golf with our family forever. Okay, Top Golf is not going to break the bank, but and it's unfortunate I blurred it out, but she, you put like $20 a month, I think. Like $10 a month. Okay, $10 a month. Yeah. I know that, that uh, she wants to do an escape room with our family. Every month she sticks $10 into this account so that we can go do this escape room as a family. Now, we could easily just wait and be like, you know what, we're just gonna pull that out of the budget. It's fine, but my wife's saying, you know what, we're going to do this someday, so let's put it in there today. And then go one more to the, to the third. The other things you're gonna see, like, at the top, tire replacement. I mean, have you guys discovered that every couple of years you gotta get new tires for your car? And every year you're like, my goodness, there's like 1,200 bucks for a set of, this is crazy. You well, take the total of the tires, you divide it by how many years, <laughs> and then divide it by 12. I know. And that's it's, how much money you put away every month. And it's fun for, for you. Now, I will tell you, my yeah, wife, for I fun, <laughs> for fun, sits in and does Sudoku puzzles, okay? So that's... <laughs> that's the level of fun we're that's, at. <laughs> yeah, that's where she's at. You know, then a, you know, this is crazy, but Christmas comes around every December. Yeah. It's crazy. And so she accrues for those kinds of things. Anything you want to say about, about just, because this is your... No, I mean, even like the smallest thing, like I have this subscription to like a recipe app and it's 20 bucks a year. I put $2 a month away for that. Like, I love doing that stuff. Just knowing that when it comes around to pay for it, the money's just there. So So bottom line, if you are the spender (laughs) like me, just marry somebody like her (laughs) and just trust them, okay? Listen to them. So let me give you number three. We gotta stomp the gas. Number three. Number three is this, work the plan. It's not enough to get help and to get a plan. You got to work the plan. Proverbs chapter four, verse seven says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. I love this verse. Though it costs all you have, get understanding, cherish her and she will exalt you, embrace her and she will honor you. Does that mean wisdom is female? It definitely in this verse seems as if wisdom <laughs> is a female. Uh, the next verse, let's move on. Proverbs fifteen twenty two says that plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So when we sat down with a financial counselor, we came up with a plan. You know, we laid out all of our debt. He had us put them in a specific order. Dave Ramsey calls it the debt snowball, so we could maximize our payments. And we, we cut all non-essentials. Like, we stopped going out to eat. We cut off, you know, cable. Mm-hmm. Um, and Dave Ramsey says, live like no one now. Live like no one else so that someday you can live yeah, like no one like else. That. We said no to just about anything that didn't get us closer to our goal. And then we printed off these pictures of our debt. They're called Debt Payoff Spectaculars. 
I actually have a picture of our fridge from back in this day. This was the fridge if you came over to our house. So there's our fridge. I mean, you can tell our kids were young. We got magnetic letters on the fridge. But what you're seeing, those pictures that are colored in in red, uh, one over here is our credit card debt that we owed. There's our overdraft, the oops, we spent money that wasn't in the bank. Thank you, Wachovia. Then there's Michelle's college loans and the minivan. And so every month when we would pay our debts, Michelle would take out this red marker. She's like, are you ready to color? I'm like, I love the color. <laughs> and she was, she's like, you get to color in 47 squares. I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> And as a matter of fact, there are actual YouTube videos. If you search long and hard, you'll find me. Like, guys, it's debt payoff time, and I'm, like, coloring in. And uh, you'll see my kids when they were younger. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's a picture of when our minivan got paid off. I was so excited. Here, here I am. <laughs> Look at me, you know, so young. <laughs> paid off our minivan. Because here's the thing. I needed the reminder we're making progress. Fun people, you will lose interest. That's why you've got to work the plan you can, matter of fact, though, if you're like, where do I get those things? There's a website, I was broke, now I'm not, .com. Okay, it's a real website. They're called Debt Payoff Spectaculars. They've got them if you're paying off your LASIK or your boat or even a llama. They're on there, okay? <laughs> Motorcycles. I was broke, now I'm not, .com. Proverbs 21.5, I opened with this verse, but says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So we told you that our counselor said, you guys can be debt-free in 24 months. 24 months. Can I tell you, it didn't take 24 months. We got so serious about this that 18 months after this, we had everything except our house paid off. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you it's possible, but you got to work the plan. And here's number four. Number four is this, stay the course. Stay the course. If you're like me, there's always something new. There's always something shiny. Apple's always releasing a new product. Whether it's a new watch, a new phone, a new car, some new Jordans, new hobbies, I love that new new. And if I get around you and you're passionate about something, I want to get into that as well. You've got to stay the course. You know the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? The tortoise and the hare. Which one wins? The tortoise. Why? Because the hare is constantly leaving the course, but the tortoise stays the course. Just recently, I actually slipped into my old ways. This is a confession time. Just recently, there was a, man, I wanted a new watch, all right? Wanted a new fitness tracking watch. I wanted this Garmin. I took to the internet. I said, internet, Instagram, you tell me which is better. And you guys were like, you need to go buy the Garmin. I was like, that's what I'm doing. So I did. I bought it. And I told myself, I was like, not a big deal. I don't have the money right now, but I've got something for sale. And when that thing sells, then I'll have plenty of money and I'll be able to pay for it. So I'm going to buy it now. And <laughs> you're like, yeah. And my wife is like, oh, did you get a new watch? And so... Clearly, I hadn't run it by her. And I was like, don't worry, it's not a big deal, because when I sell this, then I'll have the money to pay for that. And about two weeks went by, and I put this on a credit card. I have a credit card for just a few things, and we pay it off every single month. And so, I do, every month. And so I'm getting close to uh, realizing, I gotta, I gotta keep or get rid of this thing. So either I beg my wife, be like, honey, just, you know, let this slide one time. Let me borrow from the house. I'll pay it back you later. You didn't beg, but you did try to finagle some. I did, and you didn't let, you didn't no, bite at all. I didn't. You were, at no time were you like, honey, I understand. You should just keep it. No. <laughs> and then I was like, then it dawned on me that I'm going to actually be preaching on money real soon. And I was like, I can't tell. I got to practice what I preach. So quite honestly, I'm blaming you, Life Point, for why I couldn't keep this watch. I had to send it back. Hope you are happy. And I sent it back because I realized that, you know what, it's been a lot of decisions over the years to stay the course. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. You know, winning in your finances, it, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's, the, it's making the right decision today and tomorrow and the next and the next and the next and the next. Working the plan isn't sexy, but getting out of debt sure is. Matter of fact, how about this? We'll end with this. What changes have you seen or have you sensed in our family since those dreaded days of old? Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we never went without. Like, God's faithful. He always provided, no matter the season, no matter the hardships. Um, and the stress was real. Like, it feels like a huge weight on your shoulders. If, if that's you and you're carrying it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, just getting on the same page, 
brought a peace. Um, having a plan brought hope. But um, just in our relationship, it's reignited intimacy and trust. Um, I don't resent you anymore. <laughs> I like you a lot. <laughs> That's good. Um, How much do you like but me? It's just, <laughs> just, I would say just an overall peace in our home, knowing that we're, we've got a plan and we're going to be fine. It is. It's made, a, it's made a drastic difference. And there's still, you know, there, there's saving for things that we want to buy. It's a crazy concept, but she makes me do that. And it really has. It's changed, it's changed our home. Yeah. And here's what I want to say to you, because I, I hope that in no way does this message make you feel like, man, we're in, a, we're in a horrible place. I just want you to know that there's hope. I don't know where you're at financially. You might be in a good spot. Praise God, stay there. You might be where we were and it feels like there's no hope. Maybe this is your Dave Ramsey moment. This is your conference moment. This is when you go home and you have a conversation. You know, what I can tell you is a little plan can go a long way. Who knew that way back in 2007, we sat down with a financial counselor and in 2009, we were celebrating a freedom and being able to get to where we were telling our money where to go, manage in a way that wasn't adding stress to our family. You know, I think about this, one of my favorite verses, I have it tattooed on my left arm, but it's Galatians 5.1. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now this is not talking about financial slavery, but I think about how if we were created to live free, I believe that's in all areas of our life. That's free spiritually, but that's also free financially. And I wonder how many of us are experiencing that freedom in our spiritual life, but there's so much other bondage that's going on that we need to just turn that over and say, God, the same freedom that you brought about in my life spiritually, can you bring about financially? Can we humble ourselves and can we ask for help? So I wanna ask us to do this. I wanna ask you, babe, would you mind praying over our church family? And then I'll go into a response time. God, thank you for this message. <clears throat> thank you that you can use our story to bring hope um, to people. I just pray over everyone here in this message, that you would highlight areas in their life that they need to acknowledge um, financially, relationally. I ask for strength, that we can ask for help if we need it, that we would put pride aside, that we would humbly seek help, knowing that there's a freedom on the other side of that. Um, I ask for a plan, just being able to work a plan and finding freedom in this. I pray that we would break the chains of slavery over our lives and that you would just um, continue to bless, continue to provide and as we walk out your principles. In your name, amen. Let's just stay in this mode of prayer for just a moment. Just with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're in a place where you're just saying, you know what, I, I need a change. I want you to know you came to the right place. I believe that getting free financially is important, but what's more important is getting free just from from sin, from shame, from bondage of our past. And I'd love to give you the opportunity today, if you're here and you'd be honest, say, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You know, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That there's a debt that we all have, but we don't have to live with. The Bible says we can experience a freedom from that sin, and it's because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so if today, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, would this be your opportunity? Right there where you are, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wanna lead you in a prayer where we repent of our sins and we put our trust in Jesus. And if this is the decision that you're ready to make, it's declaring that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life. And I invite you to make this prayer your prayer. You don't need to pray it out loud, but you do need to pray it with sincerity. And so from the quietness of your heart to the very heart of God, would you make this prayer, say this, say, dear God, just in the quietness of your heart, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for Jesus. I put my trust in Jesus today. I repent of my sin and I give you my life. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Save me today. Change me and help me to live for you. Say this, say thank you for saving me. Just for a moment across campuses with heads bowed. If that was you today, I want to count to three. And when I get to three, I just want you to raise your hand high in the air, simply indicating that today you said yes to Jesus. 
and then we wanna celebrate with you. And so if that's you on the count of three, would you raise your hand high? One, two, three, right where you are, just saying, that's me today, I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm putting my trust in him. I see hands here at our Pine Valley location, to my left here in the center. Just for another moment, if that's you, I wanna see that, I wanna celebrate with you. While your hand is up, one of our team members is bringing you a Connect card. They're gonna put that in your hand and our host will give you some instructions on what to do with it. If we miss you, there's a card on the seat back you can grab. Let's do this, let's put our hands down. Can we celebrate together, church? Come on. 